Grab a cup, settle in, and turn it up. It's time for a couple of drips. Coffee, conversation, and occasional quips. Here's your host, Chris Granger. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of A Couple of Drips. It's my great pleasure to welcome today one of my oldest friends, and by that I don't mean you're old. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah well, man. But one of my oldest and longest standing friends, Doctor, is it Doctor or Professor? Both, but you, you pick which you want. Professor Dr. Gianluca Sergi. Hello, sir. Hello. hello. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm okay, thank you very much, Chris. Jolly good. Um, tell everyone how we met, because it's it's a great story, but you always tell it better. Uh, well, I was um, teaching at the University of Staffordshire in Stoke and Trent, um, mm-hmm. teaching film and television, and... Because I had a 9 a.m. class, I <laughs> thought it was punishment enough for my students to have to listen to me at 9 a.m. I decided to uh, offer coffee services to the students uh, brave enough to come at that time of the day. Yeah. And, uh, Full sil- silver service n- on a platter. Well, well, it was a white kettle, I think, <laughs> and some, <laughs> some random mugs. Um, but and there some was, random instant as well. Very much. Yeah, it was terrible stuff. But anyway... Um, but there was this one student who kept on coming with his mug yeah. and saying, yes, pl- yes, please, yes, sir, can I have more, sir, please? And, uh, and of course, it was you. So yeah, yeah, that yeah. was the, the beginning of a, of, a, of a friendship, for better or worse. As they say. Definitely, definitely. Yes, yeah. yeah, kept coming back. Uh, what was the module? Can you remember? No, I absolutely <laughs> can't. Something about film, I guess. Yes, yeah, I, yeah. I think it might, yeah. might have been an introduction to film or maybe, something. Maybe, or maybe, maybe, maybe. Something like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Excellent. And and then from that, um, I got a small job working in the office with you, didn't I, yeah. on the sorting the computers out? Because you had a, had your own media server at the time. Yeah, it was a different... Was yeah. Different <laughs> era. <laughs> this tells you how old I am. Um, yeah, so that's actually it's a funny, funny time because the internet uh, was becoming a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... But certainly universities were uh, using it mostly for email and and yeah. some basic stuff. And I got curious, like I often do, and people run for the hills when I get curious usually. And uh, I managed to convince the university to give me £5,000 to buy a server, which at the time they probably thought was a person uh, <laughs> that would sit in my office. Uh, that was me. That was my my yeah. role. Mm. Yeah, uh, they obviously didn't know what the hell I was talking about, and and, and the idea of having a, an IT department that would oversee all of this was science fiction at the yeah. time. So they gave me the money, I bought the machine, learned how to use the software for my sins, really. Uh, but I knew that you were interested in computers, and mm. I knew that also you had the technical know how that I didn't have. So it was nice to be able to work together. Um, setting up the very first, um, you know, online teaching module. Yeah, yeah teaching uh, at that the time. Great. I mean, you'd never get away with having a having a separate no, server to the no, main no, university now, would you? No. no, but we're talking now, twenty five years ago. So yeah, nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, I think it, it was. was. It was yeah. a very different yeah. time. Yeah. It was a freer time, but it was also yeah, slightly messier time. Yeah. Let's say. It was a nice time, though. We it was. It was. It was. Shared, it was very nice. Shared the office with the wonderful Alan Level. Yes, so no uh, longer with us. Yes, uh, that's right. With my mentor and putative father, in many ways. Alan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lovely, very nice times. And from that, we got uh, talking about uh, coffee, didn't we? And coffee machines. Yes. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I think we had we had a Krupp's a kind of steam powered espresso machine. It was, yeah, it was one of those cheap and nasty things that, however, make surprisingly decent coffee and lasted for such a long time it did yeah and in fact i still have the coffee grinder the camwood coffee grinder 10 all 10 pounds of it fantastic from the coffee chopper yes from the late <laughs> 1990s still works it's still in my office brilliant uh, yeah so we 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 graduated from instant coffee to to some kind of cappuccino machine yeah uh which people now think you know complicated you know, at the time, I think people used to come in the office and think we were mad. I remember we we um, probably were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we shared an off. Uh, we had an office next to uh, Liz Poole, mm-hmm. who's now based at Keel, mm-hmm. 
and um, she used to be fascinated. I used to be, she'd come in and say, like, what does it do? Yes. No, but also because we were making a heck of a lot of noise with those yeah. things. Yeah. Well, those walls weren't sealed as well, so you right. could hear, if you're in the next office, you could hear every kind of noise we were making. Yeah, and people of. used to teach in their offices at the time. So yeah, sometimes. that's right. So they used to do seminars, you, yeah. You make any noise in one office, the other the other office <laughs> is going to come knocking on the door going like, what in the world are you doing? Yeah, yeah. What is that? A good question what is that general? milk frothing? Yeah. No, yeah, no, no, in yeah. general, it was a good question <laughs> about that office in particular, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely and uh from that i uh went to stay with you and your family in italy mm -hmm. and we ended up buying full-blown cappuccino machines from there didn't yeah. we you had a you had a bright yellow gadget did you have a, a yellow or a blue gadget it was Raka? yellow it was yellow. yellow uh which believe it or not is still working although i no don't have way. it anymore i've given it to a friend uh uh yeah no it, it was a end of the millennium sale it was 1999 and yeah gadget had made this one machine um by all intents and purposes an excellent machine but maybe they made too many i don't know so they mm. were they were mm. having a big sale mm. and i remember you bought two and mm. brought two back and i yeah. brought i brought i bought one and brought it back to yeah. the uk yeah yeah and, and it's still working 23 years later. and and unbelievable <laughs> unbelievably we didn't put the coffee machines in the in in the hold, hold. Uh, yes. we took them on as hand luggage and there wasn't room in the lockers for them so they said oh just put them under your legs under the seat mm. uh, 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 yeah, it was uh, a different time a 15 kilo <laughs> coffee machine oh just just pop it under your legs under the yeah. seat it was a very different time it yeah a, uh, yeah yeah, different. Yeah, very I have very vivid memory of the flight back from that because do you remember we were on the plane uh, with Alan yeah. and the plane got hit by the bus. Yes. The wing of the plane got hit by the transport bus who'd already yeah. slammed his brakes on and nearly knocked the captain out at, at one point uh, getting there. Right. And then we're on the plane for half an hour and then we have to disembark while they check the wing. Yeah, uh, We made it back. That's all that matters. In, in, a, <laughs> in a very strong side wind, yes. I seem to remember. Yeah. An extremely strong side well, wind. Well, fun. It was, it was great fun. It was great fun. Uh, so talking of coffee, I've mm -hmm. just noticed we're supposed to do the coffee tasting now, but you've drunk all your coffee. But yeah. we can still talk about the coffee. Yeah. Let's do the coffee. You're loving that, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> I don't know how you can top that. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for listening, folks. No. <laughs> so, Gianluca, what are we drinking? Okay, so I'm going to have a go at this. It's called Remera Tugire Kawananziza. Uh, I think I said it. I kind of, think that was a very good attempt. Uh, it, it's from Rwanda. Okay. Uh, it's a very nice coffee. It's quite came, mellow. But came from Pact. Quite mellow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but very nice. Not too acidic, which I don't like. Mm. and it says blackberry and blueberry and actually to be fair it says with hints of purple doesn't uh, it on the, the front but. the purple i don't know yeah. but um <laughs> you got the blackberry and blueberry do you yeah i guess the purple is the blackberry and blueberry i guess yeah so, mouth feels yeah. silky yeah i would agree well, with my that my mouth is always silky so there you go <laughs> you asked <laughs> you asked the question i just nearly inhaled that yeah, there you go Guess That's what? Uh, and he had coffee trails. you give me? Yeah, yeah. I might answer them. Yes. <laughs> That's staying in. Okay, so um, mm. tell us a little bit about what you do, Jan Luca. Tell us your official job title and other jobs that you do. So I, I basically do two things, uh, parallel tracks kind of thing. So one is I, I teach at the University of Nottingham. I teach film primarily, but the job is film and television. And I'm the director of the Institute for Screen Industries Research. And I say that because that means explains the second track, which is I do research about and sometimes with uh, industry, uh, particularly in, in the States, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco. I've been Great. lucky enough to be able to do that. So, yeah. those, those two so how did you get into that? That sounds like quite a sideways shift from teaching. Yeah, um, I guess so. Um, I think I was always interested in all aspects of film, uh, both the making side of things and the exhibiting, you know, cinema yeah, showing yeah. stuff from a very, very, very 
early age, just I probably started doing something unofficial, kind of about movies when I was eleven. So mm, yeah, uh, a, a young person's film society in, mm. in my in my town in southern Italy, and and that always so that love for movies grew, and it grew into those two separate directions. One was the academic, and one was the more kind of working with industry. But mm. the, the most specific answer comes from the PhD that I did about Dolby. Uh, the sound company, and particularly the Dolby sound system for movies. Mm. I wrote a letter, <laughs> you know, that tells you my optimism in life. <laughs> I wrote a letter to Ray Dolby when I was still a PhD student saying, mm. oh dear Ray, you know, yeah. I'm writing a PhD about you. Yeah. And because you have nothing better to do, would you mind <laughs> talking to me? I, expecting absolutely nothing. Yep. And instead, I Ray was, because I, I didn't know Ray, obviously I got to know him and he was a wonderful person in so many ways but um, he contacted me he said oh how wonderful and would you like to come to san francisco and and see the company talk to me about an interview and so wow which is what i did and while i was there he then said oh who are you seeing at the ranch you know because he was talking about skywalker ranch in this yeah. film which was only a few miles north of yeah. san francisco and I said, well, you know, if you know anybody you want to introduce me to. Um, so Ray very kindly opened a lot of doors. And, f and those doors opened more doors. It became kind of a Russian dolls of the best kind. Sure, sure. Uh, and so from sound, I moved into uh, uh, talking to people who worked in production design, I worked, uh, to people who worked in production, film production, editing, all, all those kind of things. So, and that's when it grew. And then eventually I got extremely lucky uh, about having some pretty phenomenal opportunities to work in, in, in the US. Uh, when you do research in an ideal world, you share the findings of your research with the yeah. people that yeah. the research is about, yeah. um, and not just your colleagues and fellow scholars. And I was very keen to do that. It, it was always something that I wanted to do. And I, I banged my head against many doors of uh, <laughs> studio executives. Um, but eventually I managed to find a way to uh, talk to them and present the, the research and the findings that was of interest to them. Yeah. And and that led to a number of different research projects with them. At first, it was just simply sharing the results. Yeah. I remember doing one on innovation in the film industry that was of particular interest to quite a lot of companies in the Bay Area, in yeah. San Francisco, and in LA. And then uh, uh, quite a few of them said, oh, you know, by the way, we'd, we would love to do something more about this. and." And from there, I suggested projects that eventually were taken up on and, and I've done quite a lot of those. Brilliant. So who who are some of the people that you've worked with then? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh golly. Um, well, most of the different studios, um, Fox, when it was still it still existed as 20th Century Fox and, yeah. and so on, we did something rather s small, but it was, uh, it was like a, a proof of concept test that the idea of working with studios might work yeah uh and then the, the 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 much bigger ones have been with uh with sony which i did one a couple of years ago with uh, lucasfilm and which is obviously part of disney um uh, done one with the academy of motion pictures arts and sciences which are known as the oscars yeah uh, brilliant so, so, uh, very nice very nice so. and what kind of things do you Consult for one one of a better better word on what what does well, you sort of topic areas that varies quite a lot. Um, obviously, it depends. But if I were to focus on one area, I would say the future of film. Um, in other words, where is film? Meaning not just filmmaking, but also the, the whole caboodle in many ways. But but most importantly, uh, theatrical exhibition. In other words. Uh, cinemas um, film shown at cinemas uh, is there a future for that etc etc so in the I've, light of streaming platforms well even before streaming yes there was yeah. already uh, every look every 10 15 years somebody says cinema is dead yeah. and i just I just written a book on that so yeah. you know literally from the very beginning of film yeah every 10 years somebody declared cinema going dead only to find out that they, they That's why every 10, 15 years they revive 3D and then uh, for a while. And well, then, luckily yeah. it's not every 10 or 15 years. But, <laughs> um, but in any case, so there's always a crisis of some kind. Yeah. And 
uh, I guess I had accumulated enough experience looking at different aspects of filmmaking uh, that made um, some of these organizations think, oh, he may be of assistance. I mean, uh, uh, let's ma- let's get this straight. They're still going to do whatever the, the, the heck they want to do. Yeah. But, but they were wise, and I think they were beginning to realize that things were becoming so complicated and so complex um, that they really... It w- that it would be really wise to to talk to as many people as possible who could provide um, advice, and I was one of the people that they wanted to talk to. Yeah, uh, and um, and that opened up again more doors and more opportunities and so on. Do you get a sense that they're f- they're feeling very threatened by the streaming platforms, or do you think that they have settled down a, l- a little bit now and they they feel a little bit more confident in their own? Um, hmm. So one thing that Hollywood does very well is panicking. Mm. Uh, nobody panics more professionally than, than people in Hollywood. You, you, I mean, you have to understand, it. Hollywood, yes, it is a global business, mm. all the more now. I mean, mm. 75% of the box office for Hollywood movies come from abroad. It doesn't come anymore uh. from, from the US. So obviously it's a global business. But... Um, it is very much a company town. Los Angeles still is the center, the epicenter of yeah. of of film in in all aspects. But because it's a company town, like all company towns, really, it's much smaller than you think it is. And so, if somebody, it becomes an echo chamber. If somebody mm. shouts "fire," everybody runs for the exit before mm. even checking whether there is a fire. Yeah. Or whether there's a fire extinguisher right there, and <laughs> maybe it's just simply simpler. Yeah. To, so, uh, but but also you have to understand, and I'm not criticizing them uh, really, because the point is, most of the studios in LA, uh, sorry, in Hollywood, uh, are now owned uh, by shareholders. Mm. Uh, every three months, uh, they do a a, you know, a call, an mm. investors call, yeah. and they expect the the people who run the studios to tell them this is how we're making money for you. Yeah. yeah. So for a studio to do long term planning. Yeah. and not panic about the short-term things yeah. is very difficult yeah. because of those yeah. things. So in answer to your question, is no, I don't think they've got much better and I don't know that they will get much better at, mm. at, at relaxing about streaming, but there is now yeah. enough information, especially now with the <laughs> significant troubles that Netflix is going through and yeah. and so on. I think they're beginning to realize that maybe they, they the needle moved a bit too much towards mm. uh, streaming. And also the other important thing the data is showing is that the people who stream are the people who go to the cinema. Mm. So it's not an either-or. It's not yeah. a zero-sum game. Yeah. The problem, the bigger problems may lie elsewhere, not not necessarily with streaming. Yeah. So do you personally feel that streaming will ever completely threaten cinema or no? Or no. no. Uh, categorically, no. For a number of different reasons. First of all, if anybody's interested in this, First of all, uh, streaming has never really gone through a major crisis. Mm. Um, and this, Netflix is beginning to enter, might yeah, become absolutely. that first yeah. crisis. So what we don't know is <laughs> what's going to happen. Mm. Cinema has gone through, I don't know, 10, 15 significant crises, and it's always managed to get through. So there yeah. is a, it's road tested and streaming is not. Yeah. Number one. Number two, they're very different. Uh, activities. Uh, streaming is watching stuff. Movies is going to the movies. It's a, it's a social activity very different from streaming. So the two are complementary mm-hmm. because if you stream you, you love movies you watch more movies, you become more interested, mm-hmm. more aware of stars or whatever mm-hmm. and so, but but it, it cannot replace really cinema also as a money maker because the movies that are shown at the cinema that make money there mm-hmm. are always going to be much more lucrative when they move on to sc- streaming. Yeah. If you go straight to streaming, yeah. you're missing out on potentially creating yeah. that buzz and atmosphere and expectation. And it's an experience going to the of cinema. Of course. You know, but, that's, but that's what you say, going to the cinema. You yeah. don't say, I'm going to see a movie. You go, I'm going to the cinema because it is the actual social experience of going there yeah. sitting in a darkened theater with strangers yeah. um uh, it's a night out or afternoon out or whatever uh, so so it's a, it's much more complete a complete social experience than just simply saying i'm curious about this movie yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely do you think i mean 
is there a resistance within the industry to to move with the times? Am I am I right in thinking that the Academy still doesn't recognise Netflix films for for awards? Well, the, the, the Academy, in other words, the Oscars, um, the Academy has evolved quite significantly their position with respect to streaming. Uh, but what you have to bear in mind is that the Academy is made of people, <laughs> men and women like like you and me. Um, and therefore you have your own beliefs and you have your own convictions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those come from decades of uh, working in a certain way, doing things in a certain yeah. way. It's very difficult to shift suddenly yeah. your your stance on, on this matter. So also, don't forget, there is an Academy of Television that, mm -hmm. that, that, yeah. that gives out their own awards, yeah. the, the, the Emmys. And so, you know, there's, there's a question mark as to why should, you know, a, a originally there was a question mark, why would the Academy mm. give Oscars to something made for television when there is a, another mm. Academy yeah, that's that, a good that point. gives Emmys, yeah. um, which are the equivalent to the Oscars for, t yeah. for TV. Yeah. So it became, but, but, but everything became kind of confused into this maelstrom of mm. is streaming going to kill cinema going? And, and that's when research and particularly somebody who can come yeah. in like me from an outsider's perspective not yes. without something in, engaged or involved or even yeah. invested yeah that's when he can help uh, assist them because I, I can say look you know you're in yeah. the trenches you don't see what i see because i'm up on the hill that's my yes job. yeah so yeah. I, I can see a little more than you not because i'm better than you yeah but just because the, um, what i'm standing yeah um and so I, let me help you kind of thing but you know again ego gets in the way I was going to say, I can see how coming from outside could could be seen as as a neutral kind of advantage. But have you met any resistance from within? Well, there's, well, there's, <laughs> sorry, I, I can't help but laugh. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, of course, resistance. Then not even Star Wars could could put up right <laughs> that kind of resistance to the to the dark side of the force. Um, yes, of course, but then you have to expect that. Uh, yeah. They first of all, when when they hear academic, they immediately think, "Oh, this is a guy who spends his life in his office. Never, how could he possibly learn about this?" Yeah. So you need to, and it's up, it's upon you really to develop a way to make him see that actually you do know about this stuff, and mm. and perhaps what you know might be of assistance to them. Yeah. You don't know more than they do, but but you know something, you, you know the same stuff but from a different perspective, mm -hmm. and. And once they yet realize, no, hold on, this guy understands about this and, and about that and about that, and then they, they can go like, okay, well, then we speak the same language. Yeah. Uh, we want the same thing. That's the other important thing. Mm -hmm. um, at first, they, there's always a little bit of suspicion. Why, why are you doing this? Who are you? Mm -hmm. What is this? And also, don't forget, I come from the UK. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is, why would we listen to somebody who lives 5,000 miles away yeah, we have some sure. very good universities just around the yeah, corner yeah. so anyway but but I've been again I've been extremely lucky to have one or two very high up supporters of my work yeah. have been very very high up in the industry so I've been you know yeah. you need friends in high places I guess that's great and talking of friends in high places you've got a book coming out haven't you yes yes would you like to tell us who with yes of course uh, with pleasure as my um uh, your friend Gary Rystrom. and uh, Gary was one of my uh, favorite artists growing up. Um, he, you would know his work, maybe not his name, but you would know his work. Mm. He's won seven Oscars and his uh, Titanic for sound. This is yeah. uh, for Titanic, for Jurassic Park, for uh, Saving Private Ryan. Um, he's done an enormous amount of movies. Yeah. Uh, so you know, when, whenever you go and see a movie about dinosaurs you can bet yeah. your money that i'll drop terminator uh, 2 in because it's one of my two. favorite films sound yeah, of course of course i've forgotten about that so yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's won an enormous amount yeah. of awards and it is but re regardless of the awards it is to my mind one of the top two three best sound designs yeah. in the history of yeah. Hollywood. Hasn't he also directed some of the English-speaking versions of yes. some of the Studio Ghibli stuff as That's well? That's correct, yes. Uh, yeah, because Gary, um, for a while, uh, worked at uh, Pixar because he had done... So, next time you watch a Pixar movie and you see the little lamp, 
mm-hmm. you know, the, the, when the logo, the Luxo lamp, he did the sound for, for that, he did the sound for Toy Story. He, uh, and then eventually, because Gary's multi-talented guy, mm-hmm. he directed a couple of the Toy Story shorts uh, for Pixar because I think he, you know, he's always enjoyed directing mm-hmm. um, and, and is the, I think he's a perfect guy for directing for a yeah. number of reasons. And because of his interest and knowledge of animation, the opportunity came up to direct uh, the American versions mm. of uh, quite Fantastic. a few of Miyazaki's movies mm. or Studio Ghibli's movies. Because uh, that's something that not everybody underst- understands. You need Why do you need a director if the film is already made? Because of course you need to cast the voices, yeah. you need to then direct the voices. Uh, so obviously you don't do anything with the movie, but you... You know, it seems a logical progression for someone who's always worked in sound and and who has a very profound un- understanding and appreciation of animation mm. which was the other very important thing because animation works very very differently from uh, live action to, just to state the, mm. the blatantly obvious but, <laughs> yeah. you know yeah so as a director in particular you can't approach animation the same way you would uh, a live action movie because no, it wouldn't no. work yeah. yeah yeah so what's the what's the book about so we just talked about crisis and and the book is called the endless ends of cinema Ooh. because uh and it's a basic basically a history of hollywood through its major crisis all the times or most of the times when it was declared dead mm. and we go through quite a few of them i'm not going to list them obviously now but but they go from the very beginning of cinema the very first kind of deadly crisis was uh at the turn of not this century but the one <laughs> Yeah. One before so 1900s already you know uh, cinema is not even really it's, it's not, nothing more than a few days old and already they're declaring it dead yeah and then throughout its history all the different times and we end actually as we were writing of course the pandemic struck oh uh, yeah so we had to add and i say we had to because really we had to mm. add the chapter on, on covid and and everything else so yeah it's it's a history of hollywood through its crisis and how it survived most importantly Fantastic. And how long have you been working on it? Uh, a long time. <laughs> I think close to four years now, but I think it's three. Three. In, we, we finished in three years, and now the, the corrections are done, the book is submitted, the cover yeah. is done, the acknowledgements are done, the thank yeah. yous have been written. And so the book is now in production. As ah, so do you have a release date? Yeah, the book is coming out. Uh, well, dep- <laughs> depends on the publisher now, Bloomsbury. Uh how quickly they'll turn the production around, but it's coming out probably early next year. So you haven't got a specific date yet? No, they say March, but I'm trying to convince... <laughs> they tried to convince it to bring you forward a little. Yeah. Because uh, I could do with it being out as soon as possible. Yeah, and this is an academic book? No, not really. Oh. I shouldn't be saying this, really. Oh. Because really I should be writing academic books. No, I don't think you can call it an academic book. I think uh, Gary and I, incidentally... It's extremely rare to have an ac- an academic and a filmmaker working together. I was I book. was going to say yeah, someone from inside and outside the industry. Yeah. That's that's very unusual. And that was exactly the point in many ways, mm. um, because we wanted to provide. If some chapters are written exactly like that. In mm-hmm. other words, both viewpoints Great. from the, the view from the trenches. You know, yeah, um, yeah, from Gary and the view from the hill from from me. Um, but. The key point was we wanted to write a book about how not to be afraid, mm. uh, how to understand that crisis happens. There are narratives around those crises that are developed in general terms. There's a mm. wonderful book called Narratives of Crisis, which was perhaps the beginning of the, the kernel of the idea. And it's not so much what happens, but how people narrate that story of what's happened. Um, there's an earthquake, okay, obviously destructive, power force and everything else you have to deal with it immediately but then the story that is told around what that means may impact significantly in fact it will impact significantly on the choices that people then make moving forward yeah so we wanted to um ideally particularly for those who work in film or with film Mm. in some capacity or rather to realize crises have happened throughout the history of movies Mm. movies have proven to be very resilient Mm. Um, the system seems to work. Yeah, it sputters sometimes and creates problems and everything. But but fundamentally, as you know, the, the building has withstood the the, the, yeah. trem- the tremors. Um, 
So you, you need to obviously address any crisis that comes, but you mm. also need to be very careful what you say around it. Because, mm. you know, streaming, like the internet, like piracy, like before, yes, they have provided significant headaches <laughs> yeah. for people in film. But, uh, but it is one thing to say this is a headache, painful and everything else, but we can address it. Another thing is to say I'm dying. Mm. you know and 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 there's no point in doing anything because we're mm. dead yeah so so hopefully this is going to be of obviously hopefully it's going to be of use to scholars as well yeah uh but if i were to pick a primary audience i would say anybody who works and deals with film at all levels from cinema owners and exhibitors to um, programmers <laughs> mm, yeah. to to uh, technicians to filmmakers to studio executives in particular i guess yeah yeah so why do you think it is that cinema always bounces back what do you think the the, the key is what what's the strength there that that's an easy i mean i can i can answer it very <laughs> easily is uh, people love movies yeah there has never been a moment in the history of movies where people have clearly stopped loving movies mm. maybe the way in which they access those movies mm -hmm has developed, changed, evolved, however you want to call it, morphed. There's never been a moment where there's been, that was in doubt. Mm. Um, some people say, for instance, they usually claim, you know, post-war, uh, World War II period, the arrival of television, uh, people stay at home, talk about the cinema and everything else. But if you look at some of the things that were most popular on television were movies. Mm. Uh, streaming, well, streaming built its popularity on movies. Now then, of course, you have Stranger Things and other series, but but at first, everybody knew that the, you needed those big popular titles to bring in the subscribers. So ultimately, and it's global. There isn't a single country in the world that doesn't love movies, not mm. just like movies, but literally love yeah. movies. Yeah. So I think that's the secret ingredient in this Um People love movies, so the rest is how how well can we adapt and change mm. and evolve, if innovate, however you want to put it. Yeah, and and the system has been fairly uh, responsive, but sometimes slow, um, because again, for the same reasons that we said before, some, sometimes it's ego, sometimes it's just the way in which you've done things, and I'm sure this goes across all art forms you know oh well we've always done things this way in music why mm. should we change it well, now yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or whatever that's human that's just human nature yeah but i think yeah, again your answer is audiences love movies you talk about changing and evolving there mm. i mean technology is certainly one of the ways that they've they've always tried to do that i mean as you say the introduction of surround sound in the mm late 70s early 80s and then but obviously whatever the movies do the the home market then tries to imitate so you get thx in the theater then you get thx at home so and i know one of your big early academic interests was was sound mm -hmm. and the development of surround sound what triggered yeah. that early interest uh, a lot of different things i guess i would i was <laughs> i was 13 when star wars came out the first star wars <laughs> yeah. so you that that dates me I'm afraid. I was I was seven, so oh, well, there you yeah. go. but um I was a I was the target group. I was the the, the target group for the yeah, movie. Yeah. And I remember going to see the film and coming out with some friends and saying, Oh well, the sound was amazing. And all my friends said, What are you talking about? You know, the, 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 <laughs> they didn't notice the sound. <laughs> <laughs> what are you what are you talking about? And I and I thought, Oh, that's that's odd and that's interesting. Um but there was something about the way in which sound was used in that movie that kind of triggered uh, a, a, an understanding of the possibilities. Yeah. Ben uh, Burt, wasn't it? Yes. Ben, uh, whom I then ended up meeting uh, a few years later, um, also to say thank you. Um, ben had done an amazing job uh, with things that uh, up to that point, perhaps... Uh, it's not that there hadn't been films before that had done mar marvelous things with sound. There, there are examples from very, very early mm. on. The, the, the first uh, King Kong with, with, mm. with sound is a great example mm. of wonderful use of sound. And it doesn't have to be spectacular movies, obviously. I'm just mentioning King Kong. This is one of those famous examples. Mm. Adventures of Robin Hood, uh, the one with Errol Flynn, for instance, is another very good famous example of arrows flying by and excitement, yeah. uh, swashbuckling stuff. But there was something about Star Wars that was undeniably different. 
Mm. Um, and the sheer amount of uh, modes of address from sound through robots vocalizations. I mean, now, yeah. now we take it for granted, you know, you see R2-D2, you know, the little uh, trash can robot in anything, and of course it's gonna beep, right? But that was not of course at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yet it sounds more human and more emotional. Yeah. It's capable to express emotions yeah. sometimes more than a lot of Through actors. Sound. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of actors have gone yeah. to Star Wars over the years. So, you know, and that was, then, yeah, I think the only thing we'd had before that was was Robbie in Lost in Space. Yes, you know? well, in fact, Lost in Space is an interesting example again of uh, of, of of the use of sound or Forbidden Planet is a great example yeah. of the use of sound. Oh yeah, like that. but the and theremin the, and all that. So. Yeah. <laughs> and the other and the other great thing was that Ben understood that you could actually uh, uh, identify a character by a sound, mm. and this had not really been developed that much in the yeah. past. In the way that a light motif is used in music, in music. For and he understood there was something that he could do. And obviously, the most famous example of them all—I don't even need to say—is Darth Vader's breathing. Yeah. Now it's impossible. Almost anywhere in the world, if you if you hear even a snippet of that sound, there's yeah. no way that you're confusing who that is. Yeah. Right. And and it was that particular ability to create those kind of sounds that alerted me to, to that possibility. So I got curious. I just got curious. Yeah, yeah. You know, curiosity. And then um, I was, I didn't know much about the technology, but I, I, I made it a point to learn enough to understand how it worked and so yeah. on. Did you do the, the, the teenage thing? Or did you have the tape recorder and try making your own? I did a lot of, th <laughs> I did a lot of stupid things. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, yeah, I did have a tape recorder, um, change the speed and <laughs> uh, uh, i did a lot of things but um but that in many ways that was interesting because he also alerted me to the fact that the technology had very little to do with the quality of, yeah. of the work uh and because you know you can get the best technology in the world in your yeah. living room uh, and you will not be able to <laughs> to do anything particularly good unless Again, you are not just talented in a you know kind of supernatural way, but but yeah. unless you, that's really what your your job is, uh, yeah. and you develop the skill and so on. So that and and then again, because of Ray Dolby, whom when I started doing the PhD, I didn't even know existed. I didn't mm -hmm. know that there was a Mr. Dolby. Yeah. Um, because of Ray, I managed to meet a lot of uh, people who work with sound, in sound, and I realized, you know, th these guys are extremely intelligent. They are very well spoken. They can make perfect sense of what they're doing, despite the yeah. fact that sometimes, they say, well, I just, just, you know, I just did it. And I was like, <laughs> and no. Um, but they were always very articulate. But not that I expected them to be in articulate, bubbling yeah. fools, but, but, but because of the technology, you tend to think this is a technological thing. So you tend to think about people who work in sound and not just sound in other um, areas of filmmaking as fundamentally um, technicians, which yeah. is a... Uh, Engi engineers rather than artists. Yeah, it's yeah. a totally incomplete, not incorrect, yeah. because they're also very well technologically versed, mm. but, but, but they're fundamentally artists. Uh, and, yeah. and learning about their art switched on my interest in other parts of filmmaking. Yeah. So. There are literally billions and billions of podcasts out there. So the chances of finding intelligent life amongst them are so infinitesimally small as to not even be worth looking. Could you then have stumbled onto the one podcast where intelligent life could exist? No. No, you haven't. So let's uh, let's find a little bit more out about Gianluca. Um, I believe he used to be a semi-pro basketball player. <laughs> Discuss. Dis <laughs> yeah. Oh, that little nugget. Um, yeah. 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 And if you saw me in the street, you, that's the least sport you would think. Um, yeah, Gianluca's four foot one. Yeah. For anyone listening? Yeah. Well, maybe not that, but certainly, <laughs> but certainly, I'm not six foot four. Um, uh, no, it, it, uh, no, really not that tall. Um, but so a, a, a guy of average height um, playing basketball is not uh, something that you would imagine. But but you know when you're young you just yeah. think what the hell. I'll, what was your position? I'll give it a, a, I was just a, a playmaker or a guard as they call yeah. them now. 
obviously, because again, I couldn't go against somebody nineteen feet yeah. tall. But you um, did you did well with it, didn't you? Yeah, because I he, I, I took to it um, like a fish takes to water, I guess, and. Mm. And between the age of I don't know fifteen and nineteen, mm-hmm. uh, it, it was kind of my 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 other life. It was movies and and basketball. Wow! And I, I played and played and played, and then eventually um, I got asked if I wanted to play for this team in a semi professional league, uh, and they would pay. Uh, obviously, when I say pay, don't start thinking no. millions of, no. of, of anything. <laughs> um, but. But the idea of uh, being paid to play basketball is like, hey, well, oh, yeah. this is, this is uh, <laughs> I like this. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, reality eventually catches up. And, and yes, I, w- I was okay and um, good enough to play at that level. But if to move to the next level up to the to the pros, if it's, it's a completely different game. And, yeah. And um, evidently I wasn't good enough to go and play. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking. It's a nice really. thing to have done, though. Yeah, no, no, it, it was amazing. Um, I met some very good friends who are still friends today, and also I suspect it helped me understand, you know, how to remain in decent health. Uh, I guess, yeah. which is uh, which is not a b- a bad thing when you go when yeah. you get a little older. So you know. yeah, definitely. And now you're a massive baseball fan. Well, I'm well. Yeah. I've always liked uh, American sports quite a lot because of movies, I guess. You know, some mm-hmm. certain mystique around certain sports, particularly baseball, that has almost a mythological kind of standing. Yeah. I'm reading right now a great book called City of Dreams, which is about LA and the arrival of the Los Angeles Dodgers in, in LA from Brooklyn, where they yeah. were based. And there's a lot of very good sports writing um, r- books about sports in America. We don't really have that tradition in Europe in general mm. or in the UK. There are some decent books. They're usually biographies, whereas in the, in the States, it's, again, there's this awareness of the way in which sport um, impacts on, on society and on the growth and development of, of particular sections of society in entire cities. And LA yeah. is a very good example of that. I could tell you 50 million stories of how baseball impacted on LA and changed the city, not just the sports scene. So I've always been interested in that combination and that that relationship. And baseball represented this, you know, kind of uh, gateway to understanding American culture Mm. and the American psyche to some extent, much more than the other sports. I mean, yeah. Huge basketball fan, yes, but basketball very different and baseball, not just in terms of rules yeah. and regulations, but also in the relationship with the general public. Yeah. Not for nothing, baseball used to be called, you know, you know, America's pastime. And American football or football as they call it in the US. I also liked for different reasons. And that was because again, again, the culture and the writing reminded it, there was a lot about Roman gladiators and that kind of stuff. So you had a, a different kind of mm. epic tone yeah. to it but baseball has something about it that was different from the other two mm. and it was very much something that fascinated me and continues to fascinate me both both, mm. both as a sport and as a as a metaphor for for american culture yeah we living in america when you learn to speak english i learned to speak well mm. I, I learned to say a few things in english when i was in school uh, because in italy it was compulsory it still is obviously compulsory to study mm. at least one foreign language in fact it might even be two now but because um television and film in italy are dubbed unlike uh, northern countries in europe yeah no. uh that was not certainly a, it was it i was not proficient shall we say yeah um, but I had, like most Southern Italians, I had relatives in the U.S. and came to visit, and I said, oh, uh, why, why don't you come visit? And I said, yeah. And I, <laughs> nice. was, I was 17, and I went and spent a few months. In, oh, what, in, wow, what an adventure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely pivotal moment in many ways. So I spent, uh, in, two, in two, uh, two goes, I spent six months in Cleveland, Ohio, and, yeah. uh, and that's what I really learned how to speak. Did it click fairly quickly with you? Actually, it did. And yeah. I think it was just cultural. I think some people are just just wired that way. Maybe I don't know. There are some languages that I know. I'm not going to. You know, it's not going to click <laughs> even if I try because it's just my brain. German and Russian. Well, <laughs> but nothing obviously Mandarin against against those languages. But there's something. Yeah. Sometimes. So with English, he came. He came fairly natural, but also because again, I I had the opportunity to learn it when I was still relatively young. I mean, yeah. seventeen is still. Fairly young. Yeah, the brain's brain. flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So um, one of your other loves and obsessions mm. is jazz. How mm. did you discover jazz? It's, it's, in many ways, it's funny because I realized there was a, a clear connection with African-American culture, black culture, which mm. I hadn't quite tweaked and, and realized because mm. some a guy from uh, a white guy from Southern Israel doesn't necessarily immediately think, oh, <laughs> that's my point <laughs> of reference there. Sure. I, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the basketball thing was obviously something that for yeah. a long time, yeah. it wasn't just obviously... African American sport, but certainly it was. It had a particular standing amongst the African American community. Absolutely, yeah. It still does. The Harlem um, Globetrotters would have been huge at the time you were growing yeah, up, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't just that. It was more the fact that if you picked a, a young kid mm. from some, you know, not particularly well-off mm. part of any of the major U.S. cities, if you asked him. If it was an African American kid, you asked him which yeah. sport you want to be, they would Im- most immediately say basketball. Yeah, yeah. For a number of reasons. Uh, when I was growing up, that is. Yeah. So we're talking about six, late sixties, seventies. So I got curious, and the more I got curious, the more I learned, and then I stumbled first into funk, which again, that was the funny thing because my favorite band at the time was Earth, Wind, and Fire. Ah, great. And of course, Earth, Wind, and Fire have fusion music, so you get quite a lot of jazz influences yeah. Oh, yeah. in the music and then th- that was the next step the logical step uh, but I kind of feel scared of jazz music for a while mm. it felt t- too sophisticated for a little a f- bit elitist sometimes. yeah for a 16 yeah. 17 yeah, yeah, year old yeah. it yeah. felt like a little bit too yeah. but I wasn't that much into pop music but again not for snobbish reasons it's just that I found it difficult to find bands that I like I liked uh, rock music and so on. I liked all kinds of music, uh, heavy metal, maybe not so much. But anyway, I liked all kinds of all yeah. kinds of music. But with jazz, it was almost like uh, I, I stood at a distance from it. I, I, every now and then, I would hear something and say, "Yeah, that sounds like a, I want to listen more of that." But then I would listen to something more. I said, "No, nah, I'm not." I, almost like I'm not ready for it. And then eventually, I, I did. I started dipping my toes. And at first, you dip your toes with the usual stuff mm-hmm. because you hear. Uh, soundtracks or movies that, that, that use yeah. uh, usually it's always kind of blue it's always Miles Davis one way or another yeah. and I I liked it but I was the curious thing about that particular record was that I, I was more curious about who was playing with Miles Davis yes than with what Miles Davis was doing with the music itself yeah Not, I don't mean to be heretic here but no 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 um, and then I found out who was playing with Miles Davis and I thought ah okay I need to listen more to these guys. Yeah. And of course, Bill Evans was on the piano and John Coltrane was on the sax. And, he, yeah. and, and those two opened up, you know, the sax world, which is the one that I re- that really yeah. grabbed me, despite the fact that I used to play piano, but it was sax. Yeah. And through, you know, Coltrane, you start wondering who else was there out there. Yeah. And then eventually I stumbled into Charlie Parker and I thought, okay, okay, yeah. now, now I'm, I'm where I want to be. Yeah, uh, and no, nothing. It was yeah, I fell in love with with Bird, with uh, you know Charlie Parker and with yeah. his music, and I thought this is amazing. And what I don't understand and what I can't engage immediately, I like to spend a bit more time with. Yeah, and educate myself because like everything, it's an education. Yeah, definitely. And it's been a long, uh, long time passion now for the past for the past twenty years. I can't tell you who played in the 1963 version sure. of no, I'm not I'm not yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not like not that not an official and it's yeah. you know your music is your thing and I, 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 I would never be able to express myself in the same knowledge knowledgeable and a way that you can but but I know what I like and I and I probably know why I like it now yeah and, I, and no, that's uh, great food and cooking uh, I've got down on my uh, notes here uh, well, yeah, stereotypical. Tell me a little enough. about. Well, you're an Italian, yes. so tell me about food. Well, how did you, how well, did you develop a passion? Where's well, that come from? I think it's my creative thing. I'm beginning to realize now. Don't, by the way, it's not something that has always been there. Uh, mm. And in fact, neither food nor coffee nor wine were things that I was particularly interested in when I was in Italy. Mm. And, I, and the only reason why I can work out was that they were so readily available. That you uh, took them for granted. You, you didn't have yeah. to spend a minute thinking mm. about, oh, wait a minute, this is good because you know you don't you don't have a baseline. If the baseline is, is, yeah. is the sky, you go like, well, wait a minute. And then you came to England. Well, uh, but you said that. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say I had the experience of different cultures, and I, first of all, when you go to the states, you realize the influence of Italian Italians in general, Italian oh, culture yes. in general, but, huge. Huge. But, but certainly Italian food yes. on American culture. Oh, yeah. And I wondered, I thought, well, oh, this is interesting. 
because you start experiencing your own your own culture has been mirrored back to you yeah and inevitably you kind of recognize yourself a little bit in that mirror image mm. but there are other parts that you don't quite grab or grasp or whatever and then coming here i when i moved to the uk um uh, well coffee was a thing that other mm. people drink and food <laughs> it was a time where if you ordered food in a pub they give you a packet of crisps if you yeah, were lucky yeah. right so the notion of being interested in food um, and food as a creative outlet enterprise and everything else in the UK certainly yeah, yeah. when I moved here was not a thing mm. over the years however that has changed it has changed yeah, oh, very much so. yeah so supermarkets started bringing in a lot more yeah got a variety of food we've now got gastro pubs and yes but pubs got into the act also yeah. because it was there was a lot of money to be made obviously yeah, yeah. in that with mixed results let's say but nevertheless it evidently and the rise of the celebrity chefs on television yeah, which absolutely. is very much a, a, a british uh, phenomenon uh, yeah that tells you a lot because it really started here in many ways at least on a mass scale um the us had, had people like julia child before you know yeah. very famous celebrity chefs but but the, the 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 rise of people like Jimmy Oliver and everything else yeah evidently the the culture here changed pretty dramatically around yeah. around food and now the availability of food although now prices are pretty insane mm. but but supermarkets in the UK and maybe british people don't realize but you know most of the countries have smaller supermarkets yeah there's still corner shops and other things where you get your food yes, you know, so, yeah. this. But, but here you can yeah. go to to the supermarket any 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 major brand and I don't need to pick one here and you can find actually a remarkable selection of mm. food and the quality is pretty good so it's in other words it's possible for the average person to try to be creative mm. and and explore a little bit what you can do with food yeah yeah and so I became more interested and I'm I would say that I can see that becoming more and more and more a thing that I do because it, it first of all it relaxes me a lot yeah and I like the challenge. If you go only 10 minutes, you go 10 minutes. If you go, because some people say, ah, oh, I would love cooking if I had the time. I say, well, <laughs> I know, and I know what you mean, but cooking doesn't have to be complicated. And, and Italian food certainly doesn't need to be complicated. So sometimes 10 minutes is enough, and sometimes mm. you have half an hour, and you go, oh, what can I do now? And, and so I, lo- I know you like Sounds a nice so combination, so. putting the putting the jazz on, cooking the food. and Yeah, and I think the, 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 the idea there is, is again around the notion of creativity I, mm. I i used to play piano when i was very young i completely forgotten how to play piano i would love to go back to playing piano as you know is one of my yeah you know things i want to do never too late yeah one of the things i want to do eventually uh you know i deal with movies but i don't make movies so mm. i think everybody has a creative outlet in them yeah. or more than one probably i cannot draw if my life depends yeah. on it singing is best left <laughs> to others <laughs> You don't want to hear me singing, um, but I guess you know um, food cooking. Yeah, uh, is my is my thing. Yeah, you're responsible for getting me into wine because you introduced me to Californian wines, Zinfandel, right. and well, well uh, wine is a f- funny thing because again, I didn't drink wine when I was. Yeah. Interested. I mean, I mean, yeah. <laughs> what a what an idiot! Uh, but I I just wasn't into wine. Mm. Um, and it was it's, it's just uh, something relatively recent and it's not like i'm an expert or i can afford <laughs> buying sure. expensive wine but again the issue is not so much money yeah uh, in fact that's the challenge in many ways you know can you get something decent can you yeah. can, you, can yeah. you have a good experience without having to we've had a few nice wines though on our travels yeah. haven't we the uh, well, uh francis ford coppola wine yeah, I, mean, uh, <laughs> I think there's some Skywalker. Is the Skywalker Ranch wine as well? Yeah, they do, yeah, but those are not cheap. <laughs> they do make, yeah. So <laughs> on Mr. on the Mr. ranch, they actually have their yeah. own. Mr. Coppola, famously a good Italian, uh, got an interest in wine, and eventually, once he became famous and had enough money, he started his own vineyard uh, in Northern California, which is a good area to start a vineyard. And then all around the Napa Valley is ridiculously yeah, and hot. that's and that's where he, and that's where he. <laughs> Where he, where he started his vineyard originally, although now his vineyard is a lot of different yeah. places. And then George uh, Lucas, in later years, but still, uh, he got, you know, in fact, if you go to the ranch, if you go to Skywalker Ranch, th- there's, there's quite a lot of vine around there, and, mm. and they make a couple of uh, wines there. Obviously, they don't make an enormous number of bottles, no, although no. I think he's now bought uh, quite a lot of land in Italy, I think. 
and in oh, France wow. okay. to grow more grapes for wine. But yes, you can buy a bottle of wine. They're usually quite expensive. Um, I usually ask Gary around for dinner and I say, Gary, bring a bottle. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, no. Gary Just because a, he works there and Ga he can go, no, to the, go to the store easily. No, no yeah. I think he's, he's a little bit more highly paid. Can you, than can I you am. pick anything up, Gary? Just a cheap bottle of something from the corner shop. No, that. that <laughs> That sentence doesn't quite compute <laughs> in Northern California, but yeah, no, no, uh, uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. When, when you are in that part of the world, that's one of the pleasures, really. They, they make phenomenal wine there, yeah. and it's easy to find good wine for relatively low money, and, yeah. and why not? You know, it's, yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Is Gary still working at Skywalk, or is he, because he's, he's well, relocated recently? Yeah. Yes, he's moved to another city, um, but he still works. Uh, still just finished, I think I can say that. I think I saw him two weeks ago. He's just finished Indiana Jones five, wow, and um, and uh, Spielberg's latest movie, which is called The Fable Man's, which is basically an autobiographical movie that Spielberg has just just made. Nice, um, yeah, because you know, and, and to, I, actually, as Gary said, basically he's retired, but when Spielberg calls, he will always say yes. Yeah. So so long you as, would, wouldn't you? So yeah. long as. Mr. Spielberg continues to make movies. I think Gary will continue to work on yeah. those movies. But he's trying to dial it back because, you know, it's extremely demanding. We had dinner. Yeah. Got, I can't remember what time last time I was in LA because he was working on these things and they go on oh, sometimes yeah. until very, very late at night. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's not an easy life. Um, it's well paid, but yeah. it's not not easy. So has he got a studio at home now that he works from? Or? He's always that, but you know, all of these people yeah. uh, at that level have some kind of uh, set up at home, but the pandemic, I think, fast-tracked uh, some developments that would have happened probably anyway, given the technology and uh, particularly the, you know, the fast lines and the ability to work remotely. Yeah. And uh, a place like Lucasfilm, for instance, they have offices everywhere that, you know, they're in London, they're in Singapore, they're in Vancouver, they're in San Francisco, they're in LA. So, you know, they have to, they can't hop on a plane every time they need to see someone. Yeah. So, so remote working was not new, but I think his moving to a, a different location means that also he can have his own little studio there, as man cave or however you want to call it, and do his work. Beautiful. But there will always be times when he will need to go to either LA yeah, or yeah, San Francisco or whatever, to be with the director in the room yeah. doing the final mix. It sounds like you've done a fair bit of plane hopping yourself in this yeah, in the pursuit of these. You can say, yes. <laughs> yes, I probably... Going, okay for your air miles. I'm going to hell probably because of the environment. <laughs> but, oh, well, the environment is not probably the reason why I'm going to hell, but nevertheless, that's probably one of the reasons on the list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably number five or six um yeah but i, but I believe you're now. going up in a very eco sound plane soon yes i <laughs> sorry i had to for a moment yeah i'm still trying to recover from segway <laughs> yes sorry no, because i'm still getting used to the idea yeah so i've always liked planes almost at a nerdy level i, I i'm afraid to say um and i've always wanted to fly uh, uh, uh in a glider mm. And I had never done it. And recently, Fabulous. because of a number of catastrophes in my life, uh, I, I, I thought, okay, well, you know, I think it's time to do something. So yeah. I'm going to be in a glider very soon. Fantastic. Uh, Where is that going to take place? Uh, near Leicester. Uh, the south, it's, it's Leicestershire, South Leicestershire. There's oh, a, beautiful. Yeah. There's a flying flying school there, and yeah. that's what I'm going to do. And again, a glider and glide. That, um, that'll be very nice. And if I don't die, I'll we'll do another you, podcast. You won't. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But anyway, you know, uh, um, I've always, I've always loved flying and 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 a glider. Yeah, I got over my fear of flying with traveling with you frequently. Uh, yeah, but that got me over it. You know, yeah. you, you're the, you're the one that I admire because you know I never really. You know, everybody has a little moment of apprehension because our natural place is Earth, not the sky. <laughs> yeah. um, but I had never been particularly concerned about flying but uh i always admire the fact that you you know you, you and my mother for instance was like that you know she mm. really was terrified of flying mm. so anybody who manages to overcome fear and that's a it's one of those everywhere. things isn't it it's 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 a it's a scale and on, on one side you've got fear of flying and on the other side you've got one opportunity to see places and, <laughs> and to see the world and to travel and do things and you think you've got to get over this if you want to otherwise you're gonna you, you never walk out of the house that's, you know yeah but that's like everything that's a rational <laughs> argument yeah and there is the irrational fear that, yeah. that, that 
grabs you and and so you know give yourself some credit uh, the yeah. overcoming those irrational fears yeah. despite the fact that rationally you think well that's that's you know well, yeah. it's the safest form of transport yeah. yeah but that's the brain speak yeah yeah the heart says well oh, well you yeah. can crash i just hate um, the airports now yeah well <laughs> let's not talk about i like the, the coffee bars it's just a queuing yes yeah. let's not talk about airports <laughs> right now <laughs> not not fun places to be Climb to fame, climb to fame It's your chance to drop a name Trying to outdo each other's kind of lame Worn up my ship is the only aim Claim to fame, claim to fame Claim to fame, claim to fame Okay, so claims to fame then, Gianluca. Uh, tell us some. Um, tell us what you've got. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, know what you want. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, we're talking about people love stories. So, I'll just I'll just tell you a story. Uh, in fact, I just remember the other story, which is also funny, the John Landis story. But I'll leave it. I'll leave it out, just in case John Landis listens to this. John story. Landis won't be listening, and I know the story. Yeah, well, and I was yeah, yeah. I was sort of hinting at it earlier, yeah, but uh, yeah. don't know if you picked up on it. Uh, I'll leave it out because it's uh, you know a delicate, let's say. But <laughs> this, ad, this other this other one is, uh, is it can be told, and it's a sweet little story. So the academy, the again, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which effectively is the most important organization in Hollywood, um, representing all the different filmmakers, has a board of governors, uh, which which effectively runs the Academy. It runs the Oscars, but also they do a lot of other things, not right. just, not just right. the Oscars. And um, they meet regularly to discuss, uh, you know, the future of the organization, film, the Oscars, um, awards, and all these other things. For a number of <laughs> reasons, which would make another interesting story, mm. I was invited to go and speak to the Board of Governors. Once I recovered from the shock, I looked at the list, uh, who, who was the governor at the time. Nice. And, and Steven Spielberg was a governor at the time. Tom Hanks was a governor at the oh. time. A lot of very... Michael Giacchino, the composer, was, was mm. the governor. So I thought, oh, oh, oops, this is a pretty This high. could be a funny evening. <laughs> this is, yeah. this is, I, better, I better know my stuff, put it mm. that way. Or if I'm going to go and stand in front of these people, an academic from the UK. So, uh, as you can imagine, it was a bit of pressure on uh, on on me to do to do a good job, and uh, and it come the evening, the uh, the very kind woman who was effectively helping me set up and everything else again, already said. Oh, by the way, they 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 started six. They have some private conversations they need to have in the big boardroom. So you need to picture the scene here. Imagine a very long wooden table with chairs and cameras everywhere with screens and people yeah. connected from different parts of the world who those who couldn't be there because they were filming for whatever. And yeah. then there's all these very serious looking people around the table. And of course some of you recognize because you know some are like famous actors or famous directors or whatever yeah. and you, you think, yeah, this is gonna be fun. Mm. So there's this big room and and the walls were all made of glass. So you could see in and they can see through, uh. out. So the lady, you know, handling me at the time said, if you come at half past six, there's going to be food, you know, in the in the atrium, so you can have food there, and then when they finish, we'll call you and you can come in and do your presentation. So I said, okay, Great. fine. So I'll have a little bit of time to just, you know, relax for a moment. So there is an elevator going up in the headquarters of the uh, academy that yeah. then opens up on the floor where the boardroom with all these people is. Nice. So I thought, well, I'm going to go up this elevator. The doors are going to open. I'm going to walk into the edge room. I can see where they are. I can quickly scan the room and see who's there, have some food, and then I will be taken to the room to do the presentation. Uh, oh, oh dear, that's not how it went. <laughs> <laughs> how it went was that they had actually finished earlier than expected. So this poor woman had been trying to f phone me to warn me that the moment I actually arrived and stepped out of the elevator, they would effectively all be looking at me yeah. arri arriving in. So I, the elevator's door opened, and before I realized, the whole room was just looking at me, and I felt, you know, a lot of those dreams where you feel naked. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It was pretty much like that. I thought, oh, 
This is uh, <laughs> this is a little bit complicated. You know, man, man, that dead, dead man walking kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to execute, you know. But before I could recover for the shock, I saw this very familiar figure making a beeline for me, coming with a hand, uh, you know, hand stretched out, and it was Laura Dern. Right? Oh, <laughs> uh, and and so it's, before I could recover from the fact that in fact I, w- I was being, you know, laser looked at by this <laughs> this room full of very famous and important people, I had a major full mattress give the wow. running to say, oh, hello, welcome, and everything else. And she said, oh, I'm Laura Dern. And I had to reframe myself from saying, no, you yeah, are Laura Dern. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? um, but, she, she, you know, they were all, you know, it, 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 it was a, a fun, uh, uh, in many ways it was a fun evening. Every, yeah. Everybody was very friendly, and I got to meet a lot of people who admired whose work I admired for a very long time, and so it was good. And I survived, but Brilliant. by having Laura Dern making a beeline for you is not something that happens, <laughs> it doesn't happens happen every very day. Often, no. So it was, it was kind of that's, that's yeah. a funny, funny story. That's the story I can't tell. There's a, there's another story well, involving John Landis that I can't tell. Would you like to tell the John Landis story for the members only area, well, and then he's not going to hear it? Uh, no, <laughs> 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 no, because I don't want to be hit by <laughs> by a truck tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an interesting. Let's just say it's a, it's a fun story, which actually takes place at Frankie Musso, which is the most prestigious uh, historic yeah. restaurant. And in fact, if you watch the offer, which is a series uh, Paramount Plus, mm. which is just launched yeah. in the UK, is made on the making of The Godfather. Yeah. There's a lot of it which is shot in Frankie Musso because that's yeah, where all the nice. deals were nice. were being made. And nice. and there was an interesting yeah. encounter with a very famous yeah. director. If you wanted yeah. to tell it, I could chop it no, out no, and no, keep it's, it for. I tell you ransom. <laughs> no, I I know the story. Yeah, no, yeah. I tell you, I tell you, Brian. No. So, um, I've got some interesting stuff written down in my notes here, and the next one I've got written is Darth Vader's respirator. Uh, yeah, no, but that, I I kind of mentioned that before. I I remember once I think Gary and I had started working on the book. It was early days, so a few years ago, and he uh, said, "Oh, have you ever met Ben? Because Ben Burt, you know the the yeah." You know, one of the top two, three again, sound designers in the history, one of the godfathers of contemporary sound, who had done all the uh, the, the, the the breathing for Darth Vader, the, the sounds for R two D two, all the sounds yeah. for Star Wars, multiple Oscar winner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Indiana Jones, and Whip, and all these other things. So Ben was obviously a hero of mine for a number of different reasons, but I never, despite the fact that I've been at the ranch several times I, I, for interviews, research, whatever. I never actually met him because it, yeah. you know, it hadn't happened. And and Gary casually said, "Have you ever met Ben?" I said, "No." I said, "Well, let's go and introduce you to Ben." So I went and, and Gary, being Gary, Gary dropped me basically in Ben's office. And said, "Well, Ben, meet John Lucas. John Lucas, meet Ben," and he left. So oh, great. <laughs> I, 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 I sat I sat there and we talked for about an hour with with, with Ben, and I suddenly at the corner of my eye caught this. Uh, respirator, that was, you know, the kind of uh, underwater, you know, the kind of things, yeah. subs. Yeah. Wow. And, I, and I kept on, my eye kept on, you know, looking at it. It was literally one inch away from where I was sitting. Yeah. And at one point, then Ben finally must have realized what I was doing. He said, yep, yeah. that's that's the respirator I used to do, Darth Vader's voice, if in case you're wondering. So I was sitting, like, I was sitting next to the thing that had actually wow. switched me on to sound. In the first place, wow, that's so full a, circle. It was a nice, it, it, yeah. It was. It's one of those moments when you think, well, yeah, it's a geeky thing, it's a nerdy thing, but it's yeah. it's strangely satisfying to see that the, the things are going come full circle. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and talking of coming full circle, you had a nice write up in Vanity Fair, didn't you? Vanity Vanity Fair, which is virtually on every um, coffee table mm. in Hollywood, maybe not so much in. I don't think many people really know quite how popular Vanity Fair is in in Hollywood here, for instance, right? It, it's just one of those things, and people think of Vanity Fair is just what that's what it sounds like, right? Mm. One well, of those glossy magazines. It is a glossy magazine, but it is one of those magazines that people in the industry read for, because there are interviews and some good articles and some very good people writing in it. Mm. And they were doing a, a an article on the future of film, and I had just done my work with the Academy that I was just telling you about. <laughs> And the producer within the academy said, oh, you might want to speak to this guy and gave the reporter my name. So I get an email saying, do you want to do the interview? And I said, well, 
you know, I, th I think in they want like a, a, a sound bite, something like a, a, yeah, a yeah. sentence. I say, yeah, sure, sure, I'll speak with you. Uh, again, that tells you quite a uh, naive, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we did we did this interview, and I realized that the interview went on for almost as long as this podcast went. And I thought, is that is all of that for just one mm. soundbite? Mm. Okay, fine. So I go away, and uh, about two weeks later, I get an email from somebody from inside the academy. Say, and the the the, the, the inside was just nice write up with an exclamation mark and I thought what is he talking about so and then somebody else sent me an article saying did you see your your piece of Vanity Fair and I thought what piece of Vanity Fair mm. so I wrote to the woman and said but by any chance did you publish this I said oh yeah oh, sorry I forgot to send so she sent me whether she forgot to send me the thing or she didn't mm. send me the so she sent me this article, and it was uh, the first half of the article was basically a profile of of, of my research and my work and the stuff wow. that I've done in the camp. Anything else you want to mention on the claim to fame section? No, no. Breakfast for George Lucas. No, no. I told you that was lunch, and it wasn't with George Lucas. George Lucas was sitting behind me at the ranch. Like it's near enough. It's near no, enough. But it, look, it, that's where he works, so it's <laughs> hardly a claim to fame. I just happened to be in the same I'm place. Surprised there. to hear he still actually works there. Yeah, I his office he is. Retired. Well, I, yeah. I don't know whether. I, should say this but obviously it's got several offices but mm. one of his offices are still in the main house at the ranch yeah. and, you know that was what he built and it was his uh, mm. labor of love so yeah. I, I of course it would have still a place there yeah it's kind of it, it's not a contemporary building is it it's very much sort of there's a story yeah so uh, so mr lucas is a storyteller if nothing else and an mm. exceptional businessman by the way um, and he thought the ranch needed a story. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he built it, and you're talking about around about the late 70s, mm -hmm. in fact, I think, it, I think it opened in 80, 81, 82, something like that. Mm -hmm. He decided that the story was, and I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly the story, that this uh, family, an Italian family, would uh, uh, be on this boat uh, travel the world and eventually end up in California mm. and find that the land was fertile and, uh, and the grapes, you know, the vines would grow and and would start a vineyard and yeah. that's the place. And the entrance to, uh, not to the ranch, but the entrance to the tech building, which is where all the magic kind of happens, yeah. has this kind of raw iron a gate or arch, more than a gate, archway, yeah. that says... Viandante del cielo in Italian, which actually means Skywalker. So he, uh, he he thought that that would be the name of the vineyard, and as a consequence, that's why it's called Skywalker Ranch and so on. Obviously, uh, that's that's yeah. a completely made up story, but he wanted. It was, I, I thought it's actually kind of endearing that he wanted a story yeah. attached to the yeah. vineyard, and this is why some of the buildings there are meant to resemble. In answer to your point, are yeah. meant to resemble kind of slightly older. Uh, style buildings, yeah, uh, and not 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 uh, not modern. The library is like a beautiful stained glass. Yeah, so so Mr. Lucas is uh, an art collector and is a very big art collector. In fact, is a building right now uh, the museum. I can't remember. I think it's called the Museum of Narrative Arts, which right. is going to be built just outside the University of Southern California in downtown LA. Mm -hmm. It's a one billion dollar project, so it's a huge it's, it's money, and it's all going to be about narrative arts, uh, starting from paintings and everything else. And he he has some amazing paintings actually at the ranch. If you go on around, you can see, you know, it's like, oh wait yeah. a minute, is this the original? Yes, it is. And so he's always had a, a, a particular interest in art, um, and the library there, well, the, the whole of the main house where the, his office is, and underneath his office is the library where we did Gary and I did a lot of research. Mm. Um, for the book the library is a beautiful absolutely gorgeous uh place with you know art deco this that and the other and everything even the little lights like lamps were custom made and nice. ordered by you know, to local to be made by local artists and so on so you know we you could say well it's, he did that because he had the money to do so but it's a lot of people who have a lot of money and don't even remotely think of creating that environment he yeah. had this idea of creating an environment where filmmakers will flourish and yeah. and creativity will flourish. So whatever you think of 
uh, of his movies or whatever, um, that place is a special place. And anybody who works there will tell you it is a special place. Yeah, yeah. A privilege to have been able to visit and work there. So. Beautiful. And the main building is... Um, main building's kind of... The tech house? What would you... Yeah, what, what, what would... You, what, the tech peri- is, what period would you say? Well, the, the tech house is supposed to be again the the main kind of vineyard mm. place and uh, or piece, if you mm. want, in a, in a thing. And it's difficult to. Uh, I'm sure there's somewhere there's an even. It's probably a year, a fictitious year, put mm. there. But mm. I would say probably like I know a late nineteenth, early twentieth century, because again yeah. there there are some elements, some aspects of it which are very much. 20th century yeah. uh, early part particularly if you go into the, the Stag Theatre which is mm. the, ba- the main cinema inside the tech building a beautiful um, place and mm-hmm. yes quite a bit of features that you could say well if I'm going to date this I'm probably going to date them to Art Deco yeah. 1920s 30s yeah. maybe so that's uh, that's the idea but, but the whole place as you know the whole place is a, it's a gorgeous construction yeah. Yeah. yeah pencil boxes uh, I, I would say pants. Pants. Okay. Any reason? No. I'm not, no. If I'm not going to tell you the John Landis Support. story, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to, no, look, I'm not no, gonna, no, I'm not. I, I didn't I, even yeah, mention no, John I know, Landis. I know, I know. But uh, yeah, support, I guess, yes. yes. <laughs> Comfort. Delight. Why did Whichever Why word. did pants remind you of John Landis? I have no, no idea. No, no, it's just funny. <laughs> funny thing, pants. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I had a that was a favorite expression. One of my dear friends who died recently, whenever something didn't work out, you know, time honored expression. It was pants. Pants. Brilliant. Pants. Brilliant. That's a good way to end. Well, thank you very much for coming on, John <laughs> Thank you. I hope that your, your, your listeners actually found some fun in the in listening. To I'm you. sure they will. I'm yeah. sure they will. And I'm sure a lot of them would be very interesting, some of the, some of the stories there. So thanks a lot for coming on and uh thanks for listening if you're listening and uh i hope you'll come on again at some point Mm -hmm. thank you and uh try and get you and gary on for a double header episode at some point that would be i'm sure we can set that up remotely yeah Yeah, yeah. brilliant thanks a lot jan luca thanks for listening and uh hopefully uh see you again at some point cheers listening to a couple of drips the show was conceived and presented by chris granger and is a cup the mic production